I've been privileged to be able to go to Europe and see some of the most famous uh, cathedrals, basilicas, whether it's Notre Dame or the Vatican. I've been able to see some of these structures that are considered to be the most beautiful in the world. And honestly, they're nice, but they don't usually grab me and whisk me away into some other spiritual plane. Except, there's one. And that one is in Barcelona. It's called the Sagrada Familia. And it is this beautiful structure that, that is um, it's kind of new. It's, it's a new uh, modern art sort of structure, which is different than other, other cathedrals in Europe. And it was designed by Ant Ant Antoni Gaudi. Gaudi is, is the artist. And in 1883, he took over this structure, redesigned it. Someone else had done the planning and designed the structure, but one year after that guy had started it, Gaudi took over it and completely redesigned it. And this place is beautiful. You go inside, and he's made it to be like you're surrounded by nature. The, the columns are not just regular columns. They're, they, he's designed them to look like trees. And at the top, the structures that support the ceiling are the branches, and they're reaching up into the ceiling. And the stained glass goes from this, this um, springy kind of, of bright greenish, yellowish, and, and transitions into a darker uh, fall color. It's meant to evoke nature, and it's meant to make you feel like you're in nature. And then in the altar, there's a hanging crucifix with uh, candles surrounding Jesus on the cross. On the outside, there are, there are all of these carvings on outside telling the story of the nativity, the story of the crucifixion, and then the story of, of the, the upcoming glory. The doors are symbolic of the seven sacraments of the church. They're beautiful. Everything about it is beautiful. And for the first time in my experience, I was swept away. But the thing about this church is that Gaudi is given all the credit for it. Gaudi had the vision for it, designed it. But in 1926, Gaudi died. So he took over in 1883. He died in 1926. And what's interesting is this church is not yet finished. It still hasn't been completed. It's still in the process of, of finishing the, 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 the entire structure. And I found that to be fascinating because since Gaudi, there's been four main architects that took over his vision. And in the Spanish Civil War, the plans for it were actually burned. And they've had to go into his workspace to find designs that he had uh, not given to them but had still in his workspace. That's how they were able to continue the work. But the thing that's interesting to me is that Gaudi started it, but he never saw it to completion. He didn't even see it to half of its completion. It got me thinking about the story of Moses. Think about everything Moses did. His life is uh, one of many tales from the fact of his birth and going into the river, being discovered by, by Pharaoh's daughters, and, and growing up as an Egyptian, as a privileged Egyptian, and then, having to, and then uh, killing when he sees the mistreatment of the Hebrew peoples, um, the Hebrew slaves, kills one of the guards and has to run off and goes and becomes a farmer. And then God, while he's far, uh, becomes a shepherd, and while he's shepherding, he, he gets a, a call from God saying, it's your duty, I'm calling you now to go back to Pharaoh and set my people free. After the tale that we all know, we probably have seen the movie a million times of, of Moses bringing the plagues upon Pharaoh because Pharaoh won't let, go, let the Hebrew people go and finally letting the Hebrew people go and guiding the people through the wilderness and all the stuff that happens in the wilderness from the groaning and grumbling and all the signs that God provides them, giving them water, giving them food, manna from heaven, all of these things that Moses does, leading the people out of slavery into the wilderness and eventually into the promised land. Then we see here in Deuteronomy, Moses, God takes Moses to another mountaintop and shows him the promised land. 
but he knows he won't be able to go into it. He won't be able to experience what the promised land is like. Now that's for a reason. You go all the way to numbers and go back into those, those wilderness experiences I was talking about. God punished Moses because God told Moses when the people were grumbling about not having water, God told Moses to go and speak to a rock and water would come out of it for the people. But instead of speaking to the rock, Moses struck the rock. And because he disobeyed God, Moses, God told Moses that he would never see the promised land. He would not be allowed to go into the promised land. But think about that. All the work that Moses did, getting to the mountaintop, seeing the promised land, but not being able to go and experience everything you've worked for over these many years, the hard work that he's done. Even though he made that one mistake, it's still said that he is a prophet without parallel for the Hebrew people. That he was that there had never been a prophet arisen like, like Moses had, whom God knew face to face. Remember, Moses went to the mountaintop and saw God. I can't get over the amount of stuff that Moses had to do and then to not see it into completion, but I think there's a lesson in, there, in that for us. And that lesson is that sometimes the work we do is not meant for us to complete. It may not even be meant for us to experience. The work that we do is meant for us in the here and the now to be faithful and to work in, in ways that are faithful to what God is calling us to do, to be in our moment. Because in reality, the work is not about what we get at the end, but rather our work is about what we do and how we do it in the moment. That's being faithful to your call. Now I know a lot of us like to set goals. I'm one of these goal persons. I like to know what I'm going for, for, towards so that I can plan my route and I can plan what, the work that I do and I can plan how I'm going to do it because I know that there's an end. But sometimes... We just need to know what the ending is. Moses knew there was a promised land, but he had to be super focused on the individual moment. And I think that is a lesson for us. We need to be in our moment that God is calling us to be in, to be present and to be here for the moment and the work that we're being called to do. And God will bless us. I, I believe God blesses us by doing that. So how do we be in our moment? I think one thing we see in Moses' work is that he combines spirituality, he combines faith with action. He's not simply a spiritualist that just prays and, and depends on God to, do, to, to, to show him what to do or, or to just, just go into prayer and, under, and believe everything's going to be okay. Moses went into prayer, God spoke to Moses, but then told him to do something. So Moses had to be active. Moses had to act. But Moses didn't just be an actor. Moses just didn't decide what he had to do and not leave his spirituality behind. There was a blending of the two. He combined spirituality, faith, with action. I think that's what God is calling for us to be and to do, to, to combine these two aspects of our lives. You can't have a spiritual life without being called into action. And if you're solely acting without a spiritual life, it's going to be hollow. And the likelihood of burning out is, is very likely and going off and doing something else. And so how can we blend our faith and our action so that we can be faithful to God in the moment that we're in? I think that's one thing about being in our moment that we have to realize that we need to do is how do we, what do we hear God telling us to do? And when we do it, are we doing it in a prayerful way where we're listening, listening to God as we do it? So combining spirituality and action. And then the other thing that I think is important is tending to what God has given us in that moment. So I recently went on a prayer retreat by these um, indigenous people in the Catskill Mountains 
they had 12 acres of land, and one of the people there was like, oh, when did you buy this land? This is really beautiful. They're like, oh, no, no, we don't buy land. You can't buy land. You can't own land. It's like, we rented it. We're, we're stewards during the time that we have it. Like you said, there's no such thing as buying land. This land has been here for thousands and thousands of years, and it'll be here for thousands and thousands of years after us. We don't own it. We just tend to it. I think that's a, a great way of thinking about our work. It's that like God is going to present something for us to do. God is going to present for us something to tend to. And that's what we're responsible for. We don't have to feel like we need to tend to this, but also go to that thing that's going to happen in the future, or go to what's happening over here, even though I think that's important. God has given us this, and this is what we're responsible for. We need to tend to what we've been given. We need to tend faithfully in prayer and in action to what God has given us to do. So whether that is in our work, you know, as, as that working in a, in, a, in a hospital, working in a school, working in a wherever we're working, that might be our moment. So we need to act faithfully in wherever we find ourselves, wherever God has provided us a place to be and things to do. We can be where we are, tend to that faithfully and actively and be good stewards of that moment. And through these moments, by tending faithfully, as you see the Moses story Moses went moment by moment. He fought. He didn't always want to do what he did. He had some good arguments with God. But that's the key. He had these arguments with God, so he was always connected. And then eventually he always did what God was asking him to do. But the story also brings up another thing. Notice that Moses died because God had, come, had, had called him back to be with God. The people didn't know it. It wasn't a planned death, as most deaths are not planned. But immediately after the time of mourning, Joshua steps right in and assumes Moses' role. And what does it say? It says he was full of the spirit of wisdom because Moses had laid his hands on him. What does that mean? Moses had taken Joshua and had mentored him and taught him how he had done things and the way he had done things. And he would brought Joshua up, mentored Joshua, so that as soon as he was gone, as soon as Moses was gone, they wouldn't have to skip a beat. Joshua was ready to take leadership and take the people into the promised land. Sometimes, being in our moment means we have to mentor and bring up others as well. We have to, to we don't, we're not trying to move to the future, but as we work, we bring others along with us so that other people can be ready for their moment. But on the flip side of this, another question just arose to me as I was driving here. It's like, the other moment of being in our moment is, are we ready for our moment? Think about it in Joshua's term. All of a sudden, he was taking leadership. But uh, he was obviously ready, but would we be ready if God was calling us suddenly to take over to do something? Are we ready for our moment? And I was thinking, how are we ready? How do we get ready for our moment? How do we prepare ourselves? And it's the same advice that, 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 that I was just talking about. We, are, we, are, we, we prepare for the moment by being faithful to the moments that we're in as well. God might not call, be calling us to be a leader, but God might be calling us to do something on the side, like prepare the, the, the logistical aspects of whatever the leader is trying to, to do. We might be called, I don't know, to, to make sandwiches for, for a, a team of people that are over here. Whatever it is, it might seem like it's silly or it might seem like it's small. It might seem like it's unimportant. But if we're in the moment and we're doing our activity in prayer and we're maintaining our spiritual life as we're doing the activity, I believe God is going to prepare us for whenever we are called. Because there's a reason why we might be doing the things that seem unimportant. 
Joshua wasn't the one that, that went to Pharaoh, but Joshua was, was, was there. Joshua could watch Moses work. Joshua could watch Moses communicate with the people. Joshua could watch Moses go off and be with God. And if he was in his moment, he would observe all of these things. And he would do the work that Moses asked him to do. And by doing all of these things, he was ready for the moment to take over leadership from Moses and go on. So I think it's important for us to remember the work we're doing now, might, we might not even get to, get to see it to completion. We might know what's coming, but, never, but no, we're never going to experience that. But that's okay, because that might not be what we're called to be in life. We're called to be in these transitionary moments. Or we might be called to be in these planting moments, where we're planting the seeds for something in the future. But if we do that in faith with our, with our spiritual lives, in prayer, doing the activity in prayer, and tending to exactly what God has given to us in these moments, I believe we'll be ready to be in our moment. Moses went, was unequaled in all of Israel as a prophet. And it's not because of what he did in the promised land. It's because he was faithful to God in that moment, in the moments that he was given. That cathedral in Barcelona, La Sagrada Familia, Gaudi might not have ever seen the completion of it. But he did the faithful work that God had called him to do in that moment. And it's blessing people for generations. Are we ready for our moment? Are we faithful in the moments that God gives us? And are we faithful to tending what God is giving to us? I believe we can all be leaders, but we do that by simply being faithful to what's in front of us. Amen.